let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We greet you all in the name of our Lord and the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We wish you all a happy Easter. I would like you to respond to my Easter greeting, the ancient Easter greeting. is fine? Are you okay? Right. Your response will be, he is risen indeed. Shall we say this three times? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Not enough. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That shows your faith in the risen Lord. That's the greeting the ancient Christians greeted each other on Easter Sunday because people did not know the meaning of Easter. Even today, many people do not know the meaning of Easter. Of course, the day of resurrection and Christ is risen. Why we celebrate Easter? Why we celebrate the day of resurrection? Because Christ is alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and he is the ever-living God. Jesus was born to die, and he died to save us and to rise again. On the third day, he rose again as promised and according to the scriptures, and he is in our midst as the risen and ever-living God. Jesus means Emmanuel, Emmanuel means God with us. And he is with us at the time of his birth, even before that, and after his resurrection. He promises to the disciples, I'll be with you till the end of the world. He is with us at all times, in all circumstances. Believe in that. You may forget Vijay Kumar, Pastor Vijay Kumar, but never forget this Easter greeting. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And both of us wish you a very happy Easter. I thank your pastor for inviting me to share God's message on Easter Sunday and celebrate Holy Communion. I thank God for this great privilege of celebrating Easter with you this year. We celebrate Easter after retirement in the US. We had a wonderful time in Harbor Light Church. And last year we celebrated in India, this year we celebrate here. And wherever God takes us, we'll be there to celebrate his victory over sin, death, and Satan. I also thank the Secretary, Treasurer, and all of you for your love and affection. Let us turn to the Gospel lesson, it's in Matthew chapter 28. Verses 1 following. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. Each gospel gives a very clear and detailed report about the resurrection. Matthew says an angel. Mark says a young man in white. Luke says two men in dazzling apparel. And John says two angels. So this is the 
Eastern narrative we find here. It's a narration, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event. It's not a story. It has happened 2000, more than 2,000 years ago. God gave his very life for us. And because of this truth, we are free from the past and equipped for the future. The resurrection resonates with our human condition. It meets all our needs. Rather, it speaks to our needs. The resurrection of Christ brings to completion of God's awesome work of salvation on the cross of Calvary. The whole world came to a grinding halt on Good Friday. God is good. It was God's Friday in the beginning and it has become Good Friday for all people to become good and all people to be saved. So the resurrection of Christ brings to completion of God's awesome work of salvation. The resurrection of Jesus is a foundation of our faith. And that's why we are here. The Christians and non-Christians assemble in different churches, in different places all over the world. People believe in the resurrection of Jesus. People know that Jesus came into the world. God became man and died on the cross for the sins of the whole world and rose again on the third day and he lives in our midst. <coughs> so the resurrection is the central event of the Bible. There are so many references. It started with Job. Job very clearly said, I am going to see my Redeemer, my Savior, with my own eyes. The ever-living Savior, the Redeemer, he started that resurrection <coughs> belief. And then in Psalm, Psalm says, Isaiah and Daniel also says, Ezekiel chapter 37, and after the resurrection, when the day of Pentecost came, Peter and John said, we are here to preach Jesus and his resurrection. And Apostle Paul also spoke like that. He was speaking with the philosophers in Athens. When Socrates was dying, he was asked, shall we live again? To which he replied, I hope so. Ours is not a dead hope. Ours is a living hope. Because we believe in the Lord who is a living God, who is an ever-living God. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The Egyptians believe in a resurrection from the dead. Led them to call the mummy case the chest of the living. So the mummy case is called the chest of the living. But they had a fake hope. The resurrection of the believers is guaranteed by Christ's own resurrection. We'll also go through this. We'll also have the same kind of victory over sin, death, and Satan. And Jesus is the firstborn of resurrection. Spurgeon who is called the Prince of Preachers, <coughs> says like this, the resurrection of Christ is a fact better attested than any event revealed in history. Christianity, in its very essence, is a resurrection religion. Our religion is a resurrection religion. We believe in God who is alive in our midst who rose from the dead, who conquered death, who destroyed sin, who destroyed Satan, and crushed Satan under his feet. An English journalist, Frank Morrison, viewed Christianity with disfavor. 
He collected all information and he tried to find some kind of loophole somewhere. But not only was he unable to disprove the resurrection, but he was convinced by the weight of the evidence to become a Christian himself. And he wrote a book. His book became a powerful argument in favor of the resurrection. The book is entitled as Who Moved the Stone? Who Moved the Stone? He wrote this book in 1930. And it was well read. And many poets and writers like T.S. Eliot appreciated this book. Who Moved the Stone? That's what we find in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 following. When Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will move the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Who will move the stone for us? And this book Frank Morrison's book says, who moved the stone? Who moved the stone? Even though the resurrection took place over 2,000 years ago, God is still rolling back stones. God still moves stones out of our lives. Who will move the stone from our life? You know, the stone that closed the open tomb and the Roman seal was there on the top of the tomb so that nobody could remove the stone, nobody can steal the body of Jesus. So it was sealed, it was closed, sealed, but yet God moved the stone. God moved the stone. God still moves stones out of our lives. In order for us to be able to move forward in our lives, there are some stones that need to be rolled, rolled away in our lives. Some stones are there blocking us. Some stones are there blocking us, and you're not able to follow Jesus. You're not able to move forward. We are stuck somewhere. But God is there to move the stone from our lives so that we can move forward and follow him all through our life. Instead of having the stone of sin in our life, we ought to have the stone that the builders had rejected that later became the chief cornerstone of our life. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We want that stone. We have to build our life on that stone. Then our life will become very strong. Then we'll have a very strong foundation. Jesus removed our sins like soot that darkens the lamp. Like soot that darkens the lamp. Our sins darken our life. 
our sins darken our life. God alone can remove this from our life. And he has done it on the cross of Calvary. By shedding his precious blood, he has removed our sins. There is one chapter in the Holy Scripture, in the New Testament. That chapter is all about resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you go home or when you find time, you read this chapter. The whole chapter is about the resurrection. Verses from 1 to 11, resurrection of Christ. 12, verses from 12 to 34, resurrection of the dead. And then from 35 to the end of the chapter, resurrection of the body. It is divided into three parts. It begins with the resurrection of Jesus. And then it speaks about the resurrection of the dead. And then it speaks about the resurrection of the body. In this chapter, Apostle Paul provides five pieces of evidence for the veracity of the resurrection of Christ, the literal resurrection of Christ. The first one is theological. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses from 1 to 3. Apostle Paul very clearly says here, I, will rem I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. This is theological. Isaiah chapter 53 very clearly says, we read the chapter on Good Friday. He was wounded, he was bruised for our sins. By his stripes we are healed. Eighth century prophet Isaiah foretold the suffering, the death, the passion of Christ in chapter 53. So it is theological. Then there is Prediction, advanced prediction, verses from verses 3 and 4. Again, verse, I'll read verse 4. And he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. He appeared to so many people. And here he says, if you, if you read this, you will know. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive during the period of Apostle Paul, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Advanced prediction and eyewitnesses. It goes on up to verse 8. Eyewitnesses. Then the apostles, for I am the least. Then he says, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So eyewitnesses identified the risen Christ with the earthly Christ. Both are the same, one and the same. The earthly Jesus was identified with the risen Jesus, and the risen Jesus was identified with the earthly Jesus by the apostles, by the eyewitnesses. Then the fourth one, the power of resurrection to change lives. Resurrection has transformed the lives of the disciples. Peter was called a coward. He denied Christ three times before a servant maid. And he became bold enough on the day of Pentecost and he preached the gospel to the people. More than 3,000 people took baptism on that day and became members of the body of Christ. Resurrection transformed the lives of all the disciples. They went to different parts of the world. They preached the gospel 
and people became the followers of Christ. And one of the disciples came to India, Apostle Thomas, in the year 52, AD 52. He was here for 20 years. In AD 72, he was martyred. He was killed by the high caste people on St. Thomas Mount. It stands as a witness. And the whole world knows this place. You know, I, I, I remember I told you when we visited the Holy Land as pastors from South, when I was at Garrison Church at the time, when we went to the airport from Chennai to Bombay, in Bombay there was so much of problem, but I was called by one Jew, his name was Samson. He called me, sir, please come. Then he asked me, where are you going? We are going to the Holy Land. What for you are going there? We are pastors, we go there to study. We are on a study tour. Okay. Then he asked me, who are these? When I looked around, I was shocked. The pastors were in different places. Their, their suitcases were open. Their clothes were strewn all over. He said, what happened? No, no, we want to check. Then I told him, we are all pastors. Then he asked me, where are you from? I am from the place where St. Thomas was martyred. I am in a church called Garrison Church. It is very close to St. Thomas Mount. You know what he did? Sir, when you go to Holy Land, please pray for me. Please have a nice journey. Please go. And he asked me to open my suitcase. You think? Then you won't believe. They wanted to give me the business class ticket. They said, you are the leader of this group. No, I'm not the leader. I'm one of the pastors. No, we want to give business class ticket to you. I said, no, give me economy. No, no, our officers told us to give you economy. Then finally they agreed to give me economy. Then I went there to the economy section. I was just putting my baggage, their cabin baggage inside. Then one person came and took hold of me and said, sir, this is not your place. Your place is in the business class. Please come, show me your boarding pass. Then he wrote it D12. I still keep it as a souvenir. And he took me there. He said, you must sit there. The authorities, the officer sent me to put you in the business class. So that way, what I, why I want, want to say this, the apostles were transformed by the resurrection of Jesus. And God wants us to be transformed today and every day. We must have a new experience. We must have a new experience. Apostle Thomas came here. Still the gospel has to be preached all over India. Every day it is being preached. But still people walk in darkness. Walk in the dark and they still have not committed their lives to Jesus Christ. It is our duty, our responsibility, at least to pray for them. At least to pray for the preachers who go to different parts of India, to every nook and corner of our country, to preach the gospel. The whole world has to be transformed. When we hear about resurrection, there should be some transformation in our lives. The fourth, fifth one, absence of alternatives. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses from 12 to 20. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise 
if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. So this is what we see, theological, advanced prediction, eyewitnesses, power of resurrection that changed lives, and absence of alternatives. So Easter, finally, is a festival of hope. It is a festival of freedom. It's a festival of liberation. The freedom granted by the hope of resurrection is expressed in the struggle against all the forces that outwardly or inwardly deny life. Life is denied. Cross and resurrection have brought new life to us. Early Church Father Athanasius says, the risen Christ makes life a continual festival. A theologian T.R. Glover says, whenever the church returns to the crucified and risen Lord Jesus and begins to take him seriously, there is always a resurrection. Remember the first disciples proclaimed that Jesus rose from the dead. Because this happened on a Sunday, the first day of the week, after Sabbath, they transferred the special day from the traditional Jewish Sabbath, the last day of the week, to the first day. This change in itself is a remarkable fact that resurrection is an historical event. Nobody can deny this. Sabbath day has become the first day of the week because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And that's why the Christians all over the world meet on Sunday, the first of the week, to worship him, to adore him, to praise him. So every Sunday is a mini Easter for us. Once a year we celebrate Easter, and every Sunday we celebrate mini Easter. And that should be our belief, and that should be our faith. And that is the evidence. We talk about Ukraine and Russia now. We pray for them. You know, Russia is a communist country, we say, but they have this belief. The first day of the week is not called Sunday for them. For them, it is Resurrection Day. They are communists, but they keep the first day of the week as the day of resurrection. Can you believe this? But still, people are not able to surrender their life to Jesus, the risen Lord. We should not be so like that. We should surrender our life. We should ask God to transform our life and make us, make us new creatures so that we can do new things and great things for His glory. May God bless all of us and may you all have a joyous Easter. Amen.